Okay, hello. Welcome to start. Okay, proceedings which are not worth the candle. The notion that certain proceedings are simply not worth the court time and cost, which they entail, is very much a product of the new climate introduced by the civil procedure rules. And the locus classicus of the genre is Schellenberg versus BBC. In that case, EDJ struck out a libel action against the BBC after the claimant's actions against the Guardian on Sunday Times had settled on disadvantages um, some five weeks into the hearing of the Guardian action, applying the overriding objectives of, this, of the CPR and making robots use of case management principles. The judge held that the pursuit of the action in the hope of salvaging something from the disastrous outcome of the previous action could only be characterized as a desperate exercise in damage limitation and could not accept that there was any realistic prospect of a trial, yielding any tangible or legitimate advantage, such as to outweigh the disadvantages for the parties in terms of expense and the wider public in terms of court resources. Nor was it an insuperable objection that there was a right to try a right. Even in a jury action, it is regarded under the CPR as a judge's duty to take a realistic and practical attitude. He or she is expected to be more proactive even in areas where angels have traditionally failed to tread. I have seen nothing to suggest that the CPR ought to be applied any less rigorously or the judges ought to be less interventionist. In litigation of the kind where there is a right to trial by jury, that important right is sometimes described as a constitutional right. Although the meaning of that emotive phrase is a little hazy, nevertheless, I see no reason why such cases require to be subjected to a different pretrial regime. It is necessary to apply the overriding objective, even in those categories of litigation, and in particular to have regard to proportionality. Here, there are tens of thousands of pounds of costs at stake and several weeks of court time. I must therefore have regard to the possible benefits that might accrue to the claimant as rendering such a significant expenditure potentially worthwhile. EDG's words were endorsed by the Court of Appeal in Wallace versus Valentine and in Jamil Youssef versus Dow Jones where libel had been published to a minimal extent in England and Wales by a foreign publisher and no substantial tort had been committed within the jurisdiction. Two developments made the court in Jamil more receptive to a submission that pursuit of a libel action might be an abusive process. One was the introduction of the civil procedure rules, which required a more flexible and proactive approach of the court, and the other was the coming into force of the Human Rights Act 1993, which by Section 6 inquired, required the court to administer the law in a manner compatible with convention rights, keeping a proper balance between the Article 10 right to freedom of expression and the protection of individual reputation must require the court to bring to a stop as an abusive process, defamation proceedings that are not serving the legitimate purpose of protecting the claimant's reputation. Even if the claimant had succeeded at trial, there would have been a gross disproportion between the minimal vindication achieved and the huge cost which would have been entailed 
referring to EDJ's Schellenberg method for the court found that the game would not merely not have been worth the candle, it will not have been worth the wick. So, a claim in which no jury properly directed could award more than nominal damages might well be struck out. By contrast, commercially imprudent libel proceeding, whether funded on a conditional fee basis or not, should not be characterized as an abuse and will be allowed to proceed. The mere fact that the costs of a claim are out of all proportion to the possible monetary recovery at state of affairs far from unusual in defamation litigation will not by itself be indicative of abuse. Okay, so further examples of abuse. We're going to further examples of abuse. Okay, that we just finished there. There's proceedings which are not with the camera. Let's put that in. Damages for the nominal or non existent Further examples of abuse. It has been held to be an abuse to launch an action for libel based on a document disclosed in a previous action. And to commence libel proceedings knowing they could not be fairly tried by reason of a term insisted upon by that claimant in settlement of earlier proceedings brought over substantially the same defamatory charge, thereby disabling a key witness from giving evidence for the defender. An action will also be struck out as an abusive process where the defense is bound to succeed. Thus, where claimant sues in respect of an allegation that he has been convicted of a criminal offense, that action will be struck out where the defendant is able to produce in evidence the relevant certificate of conviction and rehabilitation of offenders act 1974 does not apply however where the author makes wider defamatory allegation some connected with the conviction and others independent of it the application to strike out is unlikely to succeed unless the defendant can produce unchallengeable evidence of all the defamatory surrounding facts. It would be wrong in such a case for the judge to rely entirely on facts presented by the defendant without hearing from the claimant or his witnesses, especially where the integrity of the defendant is a central issue in the action. Where the defendant, where the defendant shows that the claimant's cause of action is statute barred and must inevitably fail for that reason, the action will be struck off. Give okay, further examples of abuse. Would be where it's clear.
developing jurisprudence. Yeah, that's not me. Yeah. 